Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Grubaugh. And today we are living the line. And also tomorrow we are living the line. And Carson, are we going to be talking to somebody else today? Or is it just the two of us? That's just the two of us, which is kind of strange, actually, at this point, right? <laughs> I, I want I, like, I to say I, I miss doing episodes like this, but I've also been enjoying all the interviews so much. Um, I wish we had time right. to do more of both, honestly. Yeah, well, when we only talk to each other, we kind of have a little, you know, arm wrestling over uh, the sort of standard topics, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's wait, nice. Wait. It, it's it's fun because we build up the banter and everything. But uh, you know, people who watch all of the videos that we do, which I think that there are some people who do it, uh, might get sick of uh, <laughs> you know yeah. just the two of us. Our but ping pong like is. A lot of books that we want to cover also that get lost in the mix. I don't know. It's just a time limitations. I get it. It sucks. Um. <laughs> we apologize for any repeats, though, because some people may be new. And so we'll mention the same things. Right. It is. It is true. I'm going to have to stop saying we've talked about before, but. But um, no, it's good. It's good. It's good to go back to those things. Uh, there so, and there's some of them that I continue to want to follow up on. So it's good. Yeah, we'll be good. Uh, yeah. Today we're going to get weird, though. We're going to get really weird. So I don't know if our standard conversations are going to apply <laughs> to this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, we've actually spent a couple uh, a couple hours uh, together dissecting some of the things from the sort of uh, image, uh, you know, split off. This very exciting time in American comics where, uh, you know, a bunch of guys known for superhero stuff uh, started doing other stuff that sometimes was superheroes and sometimes superhero adjacent. And there's some really interesting and fairly gnarly things from that time period um, that kind of slipped through the cracks. And uh, one of the things uh, is a, bi a big one for me is one of the ones we're going to talk about today. Um, when's, when did you get introduced to Mr. Keith Giffen? With this book. Trencher. Yeah, that's the book. Uh, I know he's done a ton of other stuff, but this was my introduction to him. And that for me, this is Keith Giffen. I wish this is what he was still doing because it's so <laughs> cool and so different. Um, yeah, I must have got this as a kid, even though I wasn't into things that didn't look like Jim Lee. Like I got this one and I liked this one, even though it was like the strange, still one of the strangest things I've ever seen. Yeah, so so uh, Trencher is, is interesting. Yeah, Keith Giffen had been working for a long time at that point. I mean, I think his first like uh, published like fanzine stuff was like seventy three or seventy four or something. Um, so you know he's been he's been around for a really long time, and he's one of those guys that kind of got pulled up in the wake of the uh, image guys. You know, all of whom were really well known. You know, basically Marvel people at the time. And then when they moved over to uh, to Image at Malibu at first, uh, you know, the sales and the buzz and everything that they were doing was just so, like, tremendous. Uh, they, you know, their wake kind of pulled up a lot of people who were not maybe as well-known at the same time, um, which is why you got, like, Jerry Ordway, uh, you know, did stuff for Image. I forgot what it's called. Star or something? Yeah, Wild that. Star. And Wild you Star. had, like, Mike mike grell doing stuff and mike larry grell. stroman i mean a lot yeah, of mark mark texaria jay lee uh yeah. you know this like the second and third wave of uh, image people and you know because really like who the hell would have wanted to continue to not profit from the things that they were doing you know i just saw the other day um eric larson posted uh on his uh, facebook uh that you know somebody sent him a photo of the venom credits and they credited eric um like a thank you and <laughs> somebody asked him like did you did they send you a check and he's like not even a movie ticket you know yeah. uh, here, here's a right so here's a cartoonist who is you know I, I don't know how much you want to get how much credit you want to give eric larson for the venom look maybe 20 percent uh you uh -huh. know he made it bigger bulkier he gave it that like weird reptilian tongue the uh you know the teeny tiny uh, pointy reptilian teeth did you know, McFarlane he... not do all that i feel like that venom look was pretty in place from the get-go no the the all of the mouth modification stuff was huh. uh was larson and he beefed him up and gave him those sort of weirder proportions and 
you know, to me, he starts looking more like a gorilla and everything. Anyway, you know, what do you, whether you want to say it's like, you know, 15% or 20% of the look, um, you know, he, this guy contributed to this. And this is like a, you know, major motion picture that's making hundreds of millions of dollars for somebody, not him. So, you know, th- these guys who are dealing with this shit, like, why would they want to stay with these <laughs> companies that are essentially like, you know, parasites leeching off their abilities? Anyway, so somebody like Keith Giffen. Oh, shit. We got uh, a pause. Uh, had been. Oh. We got it. We got a glitch again. Hopefully. Okay. Uh. Okay. Um, Where should I start? Start over. Uh, just somebody like Keith Giffen. <laughs> yeah, so somebody like Keith Giffen, who had done work mostly for DC uh, at the time, and you know had been at various times a sort of rising star and stuff like that. Um, you know, he I, wasn't he the co-creator of Lobo, uh, and uh, you know he was the creator of Ambush Bug and and other things like that. And you know he he was not profiting from the stuff that he was doing. He was essentially like a wage worker. Uh, you know, who's not getting creative freedom, not getting a profit from it. So like a guy like that, I mean, you know, why would this not be an opportunity he'd just leap at to go make something for this uh, company that's just, you know. Well, Lobo awesome. makes sense. Everything else I've seen from Keith Giffen really feels like Jack Kirby stuff. Um, yeah, his- I, I haven't looked at a lot of his other work because I look at it and it looks like Kirby stuff. I don't. But if he was working on Lobo, then Trencher makes more sense. Just everything else I've seen from him, it's like where <laughs> and ambush bug too. Ambush bug being like a fourth wall breaker that makes more sense. Like how weird, how weird this book is. But yeah, I've never looked at much else that he's done. Honestly. Yeah, he he's a he's an interesting uh, interesting artist, and you know, like like you're alluding to here. I mean, he just got so many different modes of visual style. And, uh, you know, you can tell that he's a sort of restless uh, kind of guy in that sense. And uh, that actually got him into some trouble. Uh, you know, I, one of the first things that I knew about him, you know, I, I was one of those people. I'm always the people who I, I read manuals. Uh, you know, I read encyclopedias. I, I, I absorb lots of information because it helps me, like, get a sort of larger perspective on something. Uh, I read, like, you know, 20 years of worth of comics journals uh at various points and uh there was this in retrospect rather terrible article that basically was like accused accusing um uh keith giffen of stealing the style and specific panels uh from an argentinian artist uh, jose munoz um and uh you know when you see the side-by-side examples it's clear like he studied this guy and i don't think that that's you know i I think it's fairly straightforward, but the the implication in the article was like, this was somehow, you know, he's like copying somebody's shtick, you know, and, on Trencher and, or something else. No, for, for another, another work that he was doing in the uh, late eighties uh, when he really started breaking his style, his, his sort of Kirby esque style, he really started yeah. breaking it. And for a while that really like killed his reputation. Um, mm. This implication that he was like stealing from this lesser known artist um, but, uh, you know, I, frankly, I just think it's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it's like, it's like a knock. Some of the panels are, are actual swipes or whatever, but it doesn't mean that he actually h- held it in front of him as he was looking. Uh, you know, I think he studied this guy. And when you see him you, now with the distance that we have now, you can see that he had like four or five different modes of working. Uh, yeah. And I don't, I mean, I, again, I'm not super familiar with his work, but I don't see much Munoz in him. I, 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 that, I mean, that's the big thing when I'm looking at Trencher is still like, where the hell did this come from? Right. And, and this seems fairly uh, unique. This might be his, his hidden native style. So yeah. uh, should we take a look at it? Yeah. So you can see even just from the cover why, uh, you know, somebody of that age who is used to looking at superhero stuff and things like that would find this to be radically uh, different, but also acceptable. I think it's kind of mining some of the same visual territory as like the Max or something where, uh, you know, there's a connection to, let's call it superhero adjacent. Yeah, it's it's a totally wild style, but it has all of the 90. I think the the whole goal of it is to push what was going on in the 90s, like with the guns and the bullets everywhere and like the cable and stuff like that, push it to an absurdist level. 
Whereas the max is a little more thoughtful, like this intentionally leans into the thoughtlessness of it all. Uh, and I, I like that. I like that. It's just like, let's do this to a thousand. Um, and to me at the time, it was just like the strangest thing I'd ever seen. I was wondering if I come back to it, if I could find more precedents for it and <laughs> still not really, except we'll, we'll get to some evidence of where I think kind of the style came from, but um yeah, yeah it's just it's so strange that first image that you see here is so strange and then the book just keeps on with it yeah i mean a, a lot of the the visual references i would have for something like this would be all outside of a comics uh realm you know where would you, uh, where would you go like where is he pulling from <laughs> i wouldn't i can't think of anything outside of comics that's well, I mean, Terminator, we got a Terminator teleportation thing going on there, but that's about it. Yeah, well, the sort of like rippling urgency of it, uh, you know, I, the, there are some sort of uh, like counterculture uh, poster artists, that type of stuff. Um, you know, when, when you get people who are really into uh, hallucinogenics, uh, okay. start getting a sort of wilder, looser, rippling line art and a few of those types of artists. Uh, I guess there are some underground artists I could think of. Like I, I was just on Instagram and saw, who is it? Julie Desset. Is that who I'm thinking of? With sure. Some... That's about but, the same time as this though. Um, yeah. Some of that stuff I, I could see later. Play, playing into this, but yeah, like the associations, uh, associations I make with, styles like this come later to me like jim right. mafood is another guy i think of that comes later that could have okay. been influenced by this i don't know kind of a punk aesthetic do you know um, if uh, brandon graham has read this i don't know we need to ask him because because a lot of the uh the things you'll see in a little bit of it right there but uh throughout the first few issues which there are already oh, only are a few issues yeah. these little tags that pop up everywhere uh commenting on the action and uh things like that yeah and i mean that's to me like but besides the weird style of the book which is the thing worth con and and the the like nightmare job for the colorist so like <laughs> shout out to laverne kandirsky because he had to get this or she i'm not sure i'm assuming he yeah. laverne um had to get this in black and white and make sense of it <laughs> fill right. it in and then the colors are totally wild too but i can't imagine yeah deciphering that um yeah i think you... the the things worth commenting on are just how much fun they have and how much fun they poke at themselves and these little signs which i think you would get in lobo and some other books like that at the time uh, but yeah even like the lettering cha -da -cha -da -cha -da -cha, and then they say ditto 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 uh <laughs> And then like right here, you get like the villains are like, this guy fights you with his nose hairs, <laughs> um, you know? And I, I don't know, that's to me, like what makes this book worth looking at. Uh, well, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to just see uh, somebody with sort of, you talk about the nineties aesthetic, he's like imported the sort of body size and proportions of a lot of the image founder guys and then his his drawing style is like mark chagall on lsd um, <laughs> that's with, a good way to put it with some drawing chops thrown in right but yeah like you were saying like the job for the colorist because there's no anchoring at all it's not like you know uh, a lot of what would be really common uh you know sort of superhero technique of having you know some black to anchor everything and a page that sort of makes sense in black and white um you know, very, very little limited spot blacks through the whole thing. <laughs> it would be like get, giving a Jeff Darrow page, but <laughs> with none of the like tie to reality that would make it decipherable. It was just like, <laughs> it's just a bunch of crazy shapes. Um, yeah, this, here's another share noble this old lady this guy's the nasal python i mean here you get a better sense of where he's taking the anatomy like when when you right. get just one character it's more decipherable but when he starts adding in all the explosions and the buildings and stuff it's yeah it's completely indecipherable but i, I think another thing that i liked going throughout these books and i couldn't find it in the letters 
the letter column here understanding comics shout out by the way um but it's going throughout the letter columns here is he's really pissed off about uh people not reading their comics and like variant covers and i remember a story about keith giffen and i don't know if it was in wizard or if i read it in the back of one of these or something where he was threatening or saying like, hey, someone should release a hollow foil pot because he's really against the poly bags. Someone should release a poly bag comic that's just blank on the inside, you know, because <laughs> if it's a collectible item and in the back of these, they have this like, fuck the poly bag campaign and they're paying people or like offering an incentive to send them the poly bags of like the death of Superman you know take it out of the poly bag and send us the poly bag um so it's just that whole this whole thing is just like a rebellion against what's going on at the time uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's like rebelling by making it worse like here he is propelling himself by one arm because his body's been blown off been cut in half yeah we, we, we've kind of uh you know glazed over the the story a little bit but uh essentially he is a repossessor of souls. Um, he, he has some kind of device that uh, talks to him and uh, gives him his next assignment. And, uh, you know, he moves from assignment to assignment. So he's got some kind of docket that he's got to keep up with. <laughs> well, and that's what a trencher. He, I don't think his name is trencher. He is a trencher. A trencher and a yeah. trencher is someone. And it's not just souls. It's people, souls that should not have been reincarnated. Uh, which actually is important when you go to the Shadowhawk crossover, why that crossover happened, because Shadowhawk as a character is, a, is something that reincarnates into different people. And so uh, that crossover makes sense here. But and he's always sent after this, like the, the most disgusting. This guy just vomits on him. Um, <laughs> God knows if people can interpret any of this imagery on camera. On the screen. But yeah. Here yeah, he is like. <laughs> The the great uh, uh you know his hand lettering versus the uh, kind of perfunctory uh, digital lettering is a uh, fairly wild. I really wonder how he picked like this utterly pedestrian uh, font, uh, kind of imprecisely uh, <laughs> slapped upon the uh, you know balloons that should have been uh, <laughs> a little bit more ovular and a little bit less uh, football shaped. Yeah, it is definitely a very, and I think it's the same. Yeah, the colorist is doing the lettering as well, which is strange because the colors are so in sync with the book and the lettering is very. Because yeah, yeah. it kind of have a perfunctory like uh, office work kind of feel to to the dialogue uh, that wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, it, his dialogue is is <laughs> fairly amusing. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get the impression that, um, that, you know, the guy's chewing a cigar the entire time by the way he talks, even though he doesn't actually have a cigar in his mouth. Yeah. And, uh, and you can see that already he's got a willingness to sort of play nice with the existing, uh, structure, uh, in terms of importing the characters. I think Supreme works a little bit better than maybe the Shadowhawk, uh, <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Does. Because Supreme was such a violent book at the time. Like, I remember being scared to show my parents Supreme because it would have him ripping people in half with the guts coming out. And so, I mean, I did you ever read Shadowhawk? That might be another one we need to go back to if you haven't uh, just, read it. Just the first few. And, you know, I was I was 12 or 13 or whatever. Somebody can do the math for me. So we need <laughs> to read we need to read them like the first three Shadowhawks because they're they're surprisingly good. And really? they touch on some surprisingly intense social issues. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. I know Valentino did a lot of uh, interesting work prior to, to that, but uh, I, I have never revisited any of that. His, yeah, his, could... his indie chops are, or his interests in something more sophisticated is on full display in Shadowhawk. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Here's so, the poly so... bag. Scrag the bag. <laughs> It, it, yeah, it is interesting. As soon as you have the pinup, how uh, how much more visual sense, at least in a sort of thumbnail on a screen uh, sense, it makes because uh, the 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 density of some of the other pages it, it's just really off the charts. The density without anchor, you know. 
Um, I think it goes back to like, you keep coming back to the idea of the silhouette, which I know we right. keep talking about it, but it clicked for me finally why you keep coming back to that when we were talking with mm -hmm. Nick. Um, yeah. And I think on these pinups, his ability to work with the silhouette shows, but that silhouette gets lost when there's just all this chaos in the background and you don't decipher like figure from ground. Uh, right. And we should be clear, like, this is not a criticism of, <laughs> of the art, because like, really, it's doing things, obviously, it's doing what it wants to be doing, um, independent of whether this is like the clearest image possible, you know, um, but he, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, but that's what's enjoyable about it, too, right? Yeah. Like, you wouldn't want a bunch of pages like this. Right. Yeah, he's got like rats running away from the fight. And, uh, you know, all of these little odd details and and you know you can tell that he like loves the neighborhood that he's drawing you know like yeah. all these lovingly rendered door uh door stops and things like that and the delivery vans and stuff in the second issue um it, he's got some real drawing chops uh which which i have to ask you um so just googling a little bit about this the the word on the street which i've been able to unable to confirm or deny is that these are direct to ink drawings. Really? There was no penciling. Right. I mean, in a picture like this, it makes a little sense, but it and some of the other ones are so complex. It's hard to imagine that, but I mean, good for him. Yeah. Especially That's with such a strange style, like being able to me, there's like a lot of interpretation of form is maybe the best way to put it that I feel like that's not just the natural thing that's going to happen when you do that. You'd like have to lay it out and then distort it. So to imagine that going straight to ink is, is pretty, pretty wild. I hope that's true. <laughs> well, you, you know, the, the, the sort of hallucinatory quality of it, uh, you know, I, I, I use drugs as an example when we talk about some of these things sometimes because the, it gives somebody access to a certain kind of altered state that they might not necessarily have access to otherwise. So I'm not advocating for drugs when I say this, but uh, I have, I have noted the visual art made by people who are on certain kinds of hallucinogens often seems to have a sort of vibrancy to non figural objects as well, like a sort of evenness to the stimulation. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I, I think that's the drug quality that I'm seeing uh, and less so in this issue than in the first two issues. Definitely. Um, but, but the thing that like, if, if he is going straight to ink is there's certain decisions in abstraction about how, how a, uh, you know, how the quads are abstracted, that's consistent, how a bicep mm -hmm. is abstracted, how a nose is abstracted that, is a very consistent stylistic application and it seems really hard for it seems to me like it'd be really hard to maintain that consistency of right. decision making on the fly while you're also trying to figure out like like the these two images here where supreme is the heat is like warping the image right. or the pool is warping the image and it has the application of how mm -hmm. he tends to abstract the quads and all of the proportional weirdnesses are there. Like if he's doing that all on the fly, I don't care how many drugs he's on. <laughs> like that, it, to me, that's just crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, I, I would be very curious to um, the few images I've seen of original art are not really uh, high resolution enough to sort of dive in and get an idea if you can see any kind of, you know, un unerased pencil or anything like that. But you can imagine yeah. if he did like a rough layout. Um, you know, with like a ballpoint pen layout or something on a small piece of typing paper or whatever, um, that you might have worked out some of the anatomical things and some of the viewpoint shifts and stuff prior to touching the, the paper, you know? Well, and my, yeah, that makes sense to me because my experience with Keith Giffen is usually I pick up a book and it says layouts by Keith Giffen Right. finishes by so and so so i could imagine him being a really rough layout artist and then freestyling all of this over top of it that that makes sense to me because that is how i'm used to seeing his name 
right um, it, that he's yeah, more concerned say, with that right and we, we should say that his his uh his output has definitely changed over time and it seems like he's more dominant as a writer now or mm -hmm. you know for the basically after trencher more dominant as a writer um, but I don't. I, I think this is the first thing that he wrote solo. I'm pretty sure that everything that he uh, was credited as plotting before this uh, would have been scripted by other people, which is odd given how <laughs> you know, given how solid the uh, dialogue is here. Yeah, um, um, I wanted to point this out. This is the letter column where he asked Trencher. I thought, like, good, make a le visual letter column. That's awesome. Uh, I love that. And I noticed while we were flipping through, this is a hand lettered. Because you were talking about the lettering, I noticed a hand lettered one, and you do see how the balloon and the lettering fits the style. Uh, it, but also, I could see why maybe they made the decision like, oh my God, that's just getting lost in all of the madness. <laughs> and maybe that pedestrian, like, it was like, okay, we need something that they can latch onto. Right. And then this is a really good example of the coloring process uh for digital chameleon is advertising their services on the back like hey we dealt with this <laughs> and that's what we gave you <laughs> I, I like the i like the head heading there electric color too you know? yeah and Not but it's actually kind of legible it's more legible than i thought on this image but i don't know i it's still i, I still i feel sorry sorry more for of those fantastic colors. signs so, so it's interesting. He, he he's got his letter his letter column addresses in New Jersey. Um, the, the I, I've been wondering. I've been trying to figure out where he lived just based on the cityscapes. Uh, so, if if this is a uh, New Jersey born gentleman, which I, I suppose I should look these things up before we <laughs> we're just speculating, <laughs> whatever. Right. <laughs> I mean, this is supposed um, to be Vegas, or no? This is Kansas City. He's tracking down that like Elvis has reincarnated in like four or five <laughs> different people and he has to go get all the Elvises. That's what this last, this is the last <laughs> issue of Trencher proper. Which uh, like, w yeah, you got to wonder what happened too. I mean, uh, you know, were they getting that big a bump on the first two or three issues and then the, the drop off was, you know, not worth it after that? Or did, there was a lot of, you know, in internal image politics and stuff. I wonder if they were doing consolidation uh at the time yeah i don't know here's here's a nightmare here's robot yeah. mecca mecca elvis that's one where i wouldn't know what the <laughs> hell to do with the colors um yeah who knows because he goes off here's super superman elvis um he goes off and and then these these later ones like he goes and starts black ball comics so i don't know if he just decided that it would be better and I don't know if you got these ones and read these ones. No. It would be better to be totally in control. Um, but there are some, there's two of them from Black Ball Comics. Here's another good look at like what the colorist was getting. Mm -hmm. You see some in black and white. Um, and then th this has better production on it. It's on a shiny paper, so it holds those colors better. Right. They don't look as desaturated and, and brown. Um, like it really, yeah. it really works on a shot like this where, you know, they're doing the color holds on the lines of, of all the explosions. I think it looks better. So I don't, maybe he just felt like if he was totally in control. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I was interesting watching you flip through the ads in the back of the image books because I was getting a little flashback to, you know, some of the stuff that was, um, you know, Strike Force, which is one of those books that like just didn't come out for forever. Um, you know, uh, Profit, another one where you'd, you'd see one issue and then four months would go by, they'd solicit four more issues and then the second one would come out. Yeah, um, Freak Force. Right, which Giffen actually worked on, uh, I believe. And, uh, there's um in the previous issue too we saw a bunch of other ones that i know that were were canceled at some point uh and so yeah it, it was weird uh it was a weird time because you know some of the delays were due to the artists and other delays uh, were apparently due to uh the distribution or the printing side of it so apparently that the they had limited resources in terms of how many they could print and you know they didn't just do it first come first serve like you drew your issue and out it comes 
uh, you know, apparently the founders got precedence in certain situations and that led to some uncomfortable things. And uh, so is he actually advertising the Christmas holiday special on the back of the last issue of the magazine? And it's coming from number four. I have to shout this out because I just saw it, by the way. Totally. Yeah. I hadn't noticed this. Uh, the, he's talking about the Scrag the Bag contest and the the person who sent him the most bags is Steve Gardner of Northport, Alabama. Um, Northport <laughs> is actually like part, it's kind of considered part of Tuscaloosa where I live. It's like if you go across the bridge and you're in Northport. So Steve Gardner, yo, if, if you find this and you're still in Northport, Alabama, hit us up uh, and we'll have a, we'll have a scrag the bag 30 year, re re 25 year reunion. Uh, Steve Gardner of Northport, Alabama sent in a whopping 278 poly bags. Oh, what were you doing? Steve, what were you doing? <laughs> Did you read any of those? Uh, that's what he was lashing out against. So congratulations, uh, someone who may still be my neighbor. Um, that's funny. Uh, yeah, so maybe that's what it was, is like he was sick of his book getting put behind and kind of looking like crap and having inferior print quality. And so he went and did it on his own. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're they're advertising that. And I mean, it's none of these stories are great. They're, they're intentionally childish. Um, like this one, he, the person who's resurrected is a fart vampire. So it will latch onto people's ass and suck the gas out of them. Um, and then well, what is going on there? He's got a letter in the middle of the thing that's like, uh, I've concerned about the two police officers that you introduced in the current trencher storyline. The hard edge smart street smart detective team has, uh, I'm afraid become somewhat of a cliche nowadays, a quick perusal <laughs> of the current blah, 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 blah. Uh, I've taken the liberty of contacting detectives locally and camp and apprising them of the situation so i don't know i just he's doing some <laughs> formally fun stuff um he he's basically advocating that the characters in the book need to be changed and someone's <laughs> writing them a letter on behalf of these fictional characters uh, <laughs> from a dave elliott i don't know just this these i think the more they play the the more they they get fun with like the more fun he's having with uh, the form of the comics here you see the my buttocks which <laughs> this is the fart vampire uh you know and then they pull a gigantic nuke out of captain america's ass and then this is the gigantic fart that he lets loose afterwards um <laughs> just just to give people a sense of where these books go uh, yeah, it, and it looks like there's some more sort of, you know, I imagey kind of, uh, you know, it, an actual image ad in the back, uh, as well as some sort of, you know, but Malibu, Malibu image. Uh, here's some more image, and then he's he's doing the black ball comics. So, I mean, he's still like connected to them, but doing his own thing. Uh, and then real quick, just looking at, yeah, I think the way I was introduced to him was the images of the Shadowhawk, because I was a big Shadowhawk fan. And I don't know if you got these, but I think this yeah. is how it's introduced. And it's his style applied to a Shadowhawk story, which is right. pretty wild. Yeah, his, his art is fantastic throughout. Uh, I was very, very shocked to see that he did not script it, though. It was very weird. It made me wonder if there was some kind of... Uh you know, like editorial intervention of some type. <laughs> well, uh, but Alan Grant's the the guy that was doing Lobo, right? So they would have been friends and working together. Uh, okay. Like, I, th I think they were they were buddies because I think he does. I think he's part of the Black Ball Comics like studio. Right. Um, but yeah. this, I don't know. This is just like because Shadowhawk's a reincarnating character it makes sense that they go to battle, except Trencher's not out to get him. He's out to get uh, a guy that Shadowhawk's protecting, like in a mob story. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It, but. The, the repetitive uh, firing on the armor uh, one page back 
that's a technique that you see throughout basically all of the ones we've looked at so far is, uh, you know, he, he has a tendency to like, yeah, exactly. You, you, you show motion by showing, you know, integrating several different moments in the same image, which I think is a nice technique. The, the barfer guy uh, yeah. in the second issue uh, had that. And there's a few other things where something's bouncing and you'll see every bounce, you know. Well, and it adds to that hallucinatory aspect of it, you know, like just this obsessive mark making and um, right. patterning and stuff. Kind of pre-matrix, that, that's kind of bullet time pre-matrix almost. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Here's another just playing around. Trencher zero, fat chance of that ever happening. But, you know, we're <laughs> up to issue five and still only $1.95. I don't know where issue five is unless the Christmas special is issue five. Uh, but like running ads for right. shit that's never going to happen um, and maybe complaining a bit about like, hey, you know, it's supposed to come out from image. But right. yeah, right. We're not working with image anymore. So I don't think there's any need to flip through those other two. I mean, if if you haven't seen this stuff or if you like Trencher and you sure. haven't got the Shadowhawk stuff, definitely get, get this. Actually, this scene right here where they jump out a window and they're hanging by his intestines. That that <laughs> one's pretty great. <laughs> um, it, but this it, I didn't know existed until a sub told us about this. Sorry, go ahead. Right. You know, I, I just it's interesting to think about how incestuous all of this stuff is. Um, you know, Lobo was definitely an influence on the sort of dark and gritty, like quote unquote dark and gritty uh, stuff uh, that some of the image founders were up to. And then, you know, he kind of gets swept on, swept on in. And then like, you know, the, what was it called? Uh, image Zero, that it was like the first appearance. So it was supposed to be the first appearance to Max and things like that, that had several That's eight page low. stories. Yeah. There's a Liefeld, uh, Rob Liefeld Lobo knockoff in the middle of it. Um, yeah. What was that? Uh, what was that called? It's, it was actually good. I kind of enjoyed that. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Well, it's, it's perfectly suited for his style, right? Uh, yeah. But it, it's just interesting to think about how, uh, you know, all it really was like a sea change, but it wasn't like a content sea change, you know? It was like, a, um, you know, the, the monkeys are running the zoo uh <laughs> kind of sea change you know um and uh, uh it, and they, that underground aesthetic that we were talking about showed up like things were getting more i, I remember hiding that blood wolf that's what it was called blood wolf there you go. i got some blood wolf and uh, like some of the they released issues of that too and that was another one that i like hide from my parents because he was like on an alien spaceship like fucking prostitute ladies and stuff you know it's all a little bit more adult like chicks with like four tits or things things like that. <laughs> that i can't believe he did any more than that one eight page story i thought that was uh i thought that was all the blood wolf we deserved <laughs> no liefeld didn't draw it someone else drew it okay <laughs> someone actually way better than liefeld more more like this kind of stuff um yeah that's a great cover who, who so you said this is simon bisley i'm pretty sure this is basically yeah it doesn't it doesn't say on the inside but it says creators and co-publishers blah 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 and simon bisley so okay uh but the co-creators and co-publishers are keith given kevin o'neill mark wheatley and simon bisley okay so alan grant's not part of this one um but wh while we were looking while i was looking you know back at this stuff i still had that same sense of like who the hell was he inspired by like I thought I would have a better view of that and right. it wasn't until I read this one that I said oh okay I see the pieces like you do Bisley minus filling in the blacks mm -hmm. um, and then Kevin O'Neill is in here with his own story I think it's martial law. yeah his martial law and thinking oh okay like I know Kevin O'Neill from League of Extraordinary Gentlemen but he was doing this type of stuff in 2000 AD and right. you look at this and it's like, oh, well, that's not a far jump at all to get to right. what's going on in Trencher, like the angularity of it and the strangeness. And then I start thinking like, oh, OK, like Ted McKeever mm -hmm. and um, ah, who's the other guy? Oh, there's one other guy I'm going to blank out on. But there are these other precedents that I just because he took it to such an absurdist extreme, <laughs> I, I couldn't link it until I saw this book. Um, but it was quite good. And then I believe this character here is the Simon Bisley character. 
And this is, I think, the best instantiation of Trencher is it's a totally silent story. And it just, any word balloons are like you're dead meat and it's got like rip and a piece of steak. And then it's just, that's got to be Bisley, right? With that, kind of, that looks like his designs. Um, it's just the over the top violence and the crazy visuals and the crazy people fighting. And like, that's all it needs to be. And then they they write an apology letter for like, hey, you know, we're sorry. Did I pull that tab out yet? No. Um, wait, yeah, I pulled that tab out. Sorry. Uh, there's like an apology letter. Blackball Comics would like to take the opportunity to apologize for the preceding 19 pages. When we commissioned mm -hmm. Keith Giffen to provide this issue's opening segment, it was with the understanding that the story would reflect Blackball's ongoing commitment to quality storytelling that challenges the intellect, even as it warms the heart. Uh, what we received can best be described as little more than an extended fight scene between two hyperthyroidal quasi Neanderthal characters, <laughs> a pathetic attempt at passing off page after page of mindless violence for content, a subliterate piece of dross. <laughs> <laughs> so like they're, ha they're totally having fun. Uh, and I love it. Yeah, the 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 scene in the second one when he has been disemboweled and lost his uh, pelvis and legs and is hopping around with one fist, uh, <laughs> you know that that was what really sold me on, the, yeah, on this like concept beyond the visual, you know. And this after what you said in the beginning, where you said that there was a comic. Do you know when that comics journal article about him was? Oh, geez, I mean maybe eighty seven. Okay, because yeah. this they're running uh, the Trencher's Guide to Comics, the biggest jerk in comics contest. <laughs> and uh, so do you figure you've just had about had your fill of being gold foil manipulated cover special poly bag die cut hold stinking zippity doodah no competent cheap jack premium blah 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 and then they they encourage people to cut out I think blank is the biggest jerk in comics because and so they're going to have a contest about that. Yeah, that, so the year this would have been coming out, you know, is the year that you had absurd things like Silver Sable, uh, you know, foil cover. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I probably bought and, that. I like Silver Sable. <laughs> you know, NFL Pro and, you know, I mean, there was just a, a real, it was the, you know, it's that same market motion that happens every once in a while where all of a sudden people think that something is an instant collectible and it's easy money. Um you know, uh, Pogs kind of got some of that energy, you know, transfers to Beanie Babies. It moves from thing to thing. Yeah. Uh, and and people who, like Giffen, who have been drawing comics at this point for, you know, almost 20 years. I mean, I could imagine it would be frustrating as hell to be like, well, what what are you thinking? You know, um, well, like what? Yeah, I. I drew, I drew something. You should look at it because you like my drawings. <laughs> you know? And that goes back to that story. I wish I could remember where I heard it, but I know for a fact it was Keith Giffen and, and reading these like further cemented in me that it had to have been him where he was talking about putting out a comic in a poly bag that had no pages in it. Because it's like, I spend a month at least on this. It's for you to read. It's not for you to keep in a goddamn bag. Uh, it's not for you to keep pristine and... I, I love that and I, that that runs through everything they do is that poking fun at the time um, yeah, yeah so uh, so if anybody's wondering whether they should pick this up uh, well you know if you've listened to us yammer uh, this this long about it probably yeah you should uh, but also I mean you know there there are a lot of these available uh, so it's not it's not like there's a shortage I mean I, I picked mine up for very you know less than you would expect to pay for a trade paperback of collecting all the issues. Yeah, for sure. And probably because there was a speculator market because right. my neighbor up in Northport bought 300 <laughs> copies. Um, yeah, they probably sold like he probably he probably made enough money to just check out and do nothing else for a few years afterwards. Yeah. And then people didn't buy the second and third issue. So it's the first issue, at least, probably really easy to get a hold of. But I didn't have any problem finding these for cheap either. Yeah. Um, and they're and in good condition. I don't know what happened to my original ones. I yeah, had to rebuy the, them. Lost to time. 
<laughs> but yeah, he, he's a he's a you know he's he's a really fantastic stylist, and, and I always enjoy uh, I always enjoy somebody who likes doesn't just rest in a single mode, you know. Although there's something like admirable about that too, um, you know. I, some somebody like him who you know can do something really well and enough to be commercially successful on a certain level and then it's like okay well i'm done with that for a while and then does something different you know uh, i think that's one of the things that's really shitty about the sort of uh you know defamation and saying like you're copying this person you're taking something from them you know as if like working in a mode that resembles somebody else is equivalent to um depriving that person of something i mean you know i you can see so you can imagine somebody who's restless wanting to you know copy and study and and build their own sort of skill set uh and you know i i don't know maybe well, maybe i'm particularly sympathetic to that given uh <laughs> you know our interests but well yeah i mean obviously a anyone who watches the channel and has had any exposure to what i do knows that that's me in a nutshell that's like I don't have a style. I have a mode of operating that's consistent, which is right. <laughs> whatever the story is, is going to drive what it looks like. And, and I find, uh, I think it's a, maybe a very, maybe he was a little ahead of his times in that, but, um, I think that's the most contemporary way of working really is, is the remix culture. And uh, I mean, there's always something to be said for, someone like Brandon or someone like Nick, Nick Patera that had their, their vision. But I find stylistic stealing to be such a rich source of meaning. And I, I mean, we talk about things that we always come back to. That's one of my mm -hmm. core things that I come back to. Um, but to me also, like, I, he got well, so in his own lane in these books, like the only, if, if you like this, uh, go check out, uh, Mr. Majestic hmm. issues seven, eight, and nine from Wildstorm. The first time I ever saw Eric Canetti's work, or maybe just eight and nine. Um, he's probably the only other thing I can think of that is this strange. And his work has, has gotten more palatable since then, which is unfortunate. And so both of those guys, it's like, yeah, I know you're stylistically restless, but go back to this. This was so cool. Um, yeah, it, it I, looks like a hell of a lot of fun to draw too. Uh, you know, I I've been tempted sometimes to sort of think about it like a exercise in like how much can you do and how little too. Uh, you know, especially like I, I went through a period where I was working like ten or twelve hours on a single page, um, and I don't necessarily think those pages were better than the ones that I spent five or six hours on. You know, yeah, uh, they're just more dense. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and th there was definitely a point where I just thought to myself, like, if I'm, when I make a 24 hour comic, which I've done, you know, a couple of times, people can just read it and I'm done with it. Like 24 hours have, have gone by and then there it is. You can read it. And I, I never had any complaint about the art. I didn't even tell people that, you know, my autobiographical one was a 24 hour comic. It just, you know, people just yeah. read it. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and it has occurred to me sometimes like, you know, that, if you're Keith Giffen and you can apparently draw like this with just a little bit of layout and then directly in ink, like, why would you work in another mode? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just so, from a... And you're creating what I think is, it's like, like when Mike Mignola came out, his, when he really hit Mignola, right. It's like this thing that's so different that it's just like it, yeah, it's just so different and it's so cool. But something about what Mignola did was really easy to copy. Mm -hmm. um, as strange and, and unique as it was, there's been a ton of people who have been able to mimic that to some extent. When you get something this unique, I, I feel like if he would have spent more time running with this, he he. I don't know if he would have got clones because this seems harder to copy to me. It like Mignola's abstractions make sense, and that's the thing. Like once someone came to those conclusions about this is how to abstract and simplify forms, it was understandable and parsable for everyone else. 
I would have been curious to see if he had run with this longer. Could people have parsed it eventually and had clones? Would he have got clones? Or <laughs> is it too strange to parse? Um, it, I just remember thinking a, a lot about that with guys like Mignola and Giffen is like developing a, a recognizable style that you shouldn't get near because it's too much that guy. And it's unfortunate that he walked away back to the Kirby stuff, which is so much someone else's identifiable. You shouldn't touch it style, but uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> there's a good, a good eight issues, nine issues worth yeah. of this. Yeah. And nobody's obligated to do anything, right? That's, no, uh, I mean, you do, you do through. you just as right. a fan, I lament, you know, what if there had been yeah. 20 years of this and how much further could he have pushed it? And well, I mean, he probably like, he didn't want to do this because he was poking, he was taking something that he disliked and pushing it to the extreme pun intended. <laughs> um, and so I could also imagine, I mean, he's advertising like understanding comics on the back of Trencher number one. So I, I could definitely see like, if I came into this style just for shits and giggles, like I've joked about doing the, uh, what was I going to call it? I don't know the mom in yoga pants right. like demon slayer comic I couldn't live with that as the thing I do for the rest of my life oh <laughs> milf milf I couldn't do milf for the rest of my life because I want to do other things more thoughtful things so I, I get it I get why he didn't do it but as a fan I just want I love it I want more of it. Uh, if, if you're out there uh and uh Mr. Giffen and uh you ever want to talk uh we'd love to talk to you uh love love to pick your brain about uh how how you did the pages and uh, what you were thinking and uh you know um argue about the uh, legalization of uh you know various uh drugs and things like that yeah it's it's gonna be one of those things where he's like i've never taken a drug in my life like yeah, every oh, no, artist not, yeah every artist that you talk to where you're like that looks like you're on psychedelics like no no not me <laughs> yeah uh, not to not to to tread the same ground uh, as before but uh you know the reason that psychedelics work is because you have receptors uh for those drugs yeah uh, you know you, which Im implies that your brain is producing something that is an equivalent to that at some point uh in your life and uh, definitely uh to, for me anyway uh, you know never having done any of those things i've experienced all of those <laughs> all of those uh you know supposed side effects uh, at various times and in various states without ever having taken anything. So um, I, I don't mean to say oh, this person does drugs because I look at this thing. It's just that it's interesting to me that that particular phenomenon, the the wall is as alive as the person is. Yeah. That is a identifiable thing that you can see in the drawings of people who are um, have experienced, you know, hallucinogens or whatever. Um, but not like I said, not that I know from firsthand experience. Also, yeah. hand to me. <laughs> i've never had an alive wall sean so <laughs> oh yeah I, no have you ever stared at a wall and stared at the at the uh at, at the wall and watch it undulate uh with your with your uh the pulse of your of your blood flow not undulate i'm more likely to get caught up like uh like i look up and see the texture on the ceiling and i'll start the par parahesia or whatever it's called where you start seeing the the you know you start seeing faces and stuff in it oh you do too okay yeah, I mean that's normal. You're gonna well, you're gonna take chaos and turn it into meaning. But I don't think I've ever seen my my pulse undulate. I was trying to do that thing that we were talking about with uh, Doctor Gamlin, with Paul Gamlin, about like crossing your eyes to change the perspective. I've never done yeah. that before, but I was trying that, and that's that's weird. It's kind of like the uh, on a camera in a movie yeah. where you do those zooms. It's strange. Yeah. You can see your cone of vision shrink. Um, right. That was That's a new how one the magic key. eye works. You can you can practice with a magic eye, and what you can do is just pretend that you're looking at something that's further away, uh, while keeping your focus in the same place. It's a very it's a spooky thing, especially if you can learn to not just do it, but also actually take in the experience of doing it at the same time. It doesn't work with a flat image, by the way. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. You have to see it in real life because yeah. what you're doing right. is by changing your focal field, you're shrinking and expanding your cone of vision. Right. And the room slightly goes, zzz, right. zzz. and if you know anything about like properly laying out perspective and using the diagonal vanishing points to set a good cone of vision and all of that stuff, you're like, oh yeah, you know, like, right. cause I'm constantly like with my students, like, I don't want to explain all the mechanics of setting up 
a cone of vision to like a drawing one class. So I'll give them a point and they'll be like, it doesn't look like squares. And it's like, yeah, yeah, it's not properly chosen. Just imagine we're shrinking. And so I would like watching my field of vision do that was pretty cool. Um, anyways, we're, <laughs> we're, way off, we're way off topic. But yeah, that, that was an interesting thing I followed up with uh, after we talked. To, so if you haven't watched that, go listen to our talk with uh, Dr. Lawrence Sinchich and Dr. Paul Gamlin about vision. Um, Neuro-ophthalmologists talking comics. Yeah, there's, there's some good, some good uh, little experiments to go try in that episode. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thanks for uh, watching, guys. And uh, if you have not done so yet, please check out The Strange Death of Alex Raymond. We got lots of copies left. You can pick them up at your uh, bookstore, your comic store, or from livingthelinebooks.com. And uh, speaking of Living Line books, we are going to have uh, some more books coming out uh, this fall. Uh, first up is going to be Plaza by uh, Yuichi Yokoyama, which I'm very excited about. Talk about oddball books. Uh, yeah. This is a, a really something else. Um, I've got a few sample pages up, and it's going to be in the August previews, but it's going to be for sale in September. And then uh, after that, uh, either a month or two after that, is going to be The Exile by Eric Creek. Uh, uh, brilliant uh, Dutch illustrator, uh, and uh, it's what he calls his uh, Viking, uh, sorry, his um, Viking Western, uh, which is a very exciting book. Just finished the uh, text polish for that, and uh, I've lettered about 30 of the pages so far. And, um, and then after that is going to be some other books. We've announced one of them, uh, but I won't bore you with the details right now. We got those two coming up. Get, we'll throw get up an image screen. of Centralia. That that will be the the third one that you've got. It that that yeah. one's really exciting too. Working on um, the text adaptation for Centralia right now, or actually right before uh, we started talking today. Uh, awesome. And it's going to be uh, awesome. Uh, great art. Uh, very very fun book. It's very funny, uh, uh, in in a in a kind of a mild humor kind of way. Uh, I really enjoy it. Yeah, and then get get yourself on Sean's Living the Line uh, um, newsletter list too, so all yeah. new announcements that you can you can keep up with what he's doing as a publisher because I think that's the next exciting expansion of what yeah. we've been doing is con content that Sean now has a venue to continue the ethics of what we care about on the channel into a publishing line. Um, yeah. And as we said last time, that's really for me not having to do much work except just help be a hype man. It's very exciting to be tangential to it, to it all, and and seeing it unfold, um, like kind of kind of the some pull quotes for these books coming up. Yeah, yeah, of course, obviously, we'll promote the hell out of them. Um, so I'm really excited about all of that, and I think that's the the best way that you guys can support the the mission of the channel going forward is support Sean as a publisher um, get on that list and know what he's got coming forward and like and subscribe and patreon and buttons and bells and all that good stuff <laughs> all right you guys have a good one okay bye